Hi class, this is Dr. O'Connor and in this video I'm going to discuss the alkene polymers and then we're going to talk about benzene and other aromatic compounds. In your book there is a chapter on polymers. You can read it if you would like, but what I'm going to do is I will cover the different types of polymers as we go. If you read the chapter on polymers, that's fine. That'll just give you a better idea of what they are. But as far as the material that I test you on, it'll be from the videos, not from that chapter. So let's go ahead and start. Polymers are very large molecules, and they're formed by the repetitive bonding together of many smaller molecules called monomers. A small molecule that is used to prepare a polymer. So here we're going to talk about polymers that are formed from alkene molecules. Okay, so later when we get into biochemistry we're going to be talking about biopolymers like DNA and some different proteins. They are a bit more complicated than the synthetic polymers that we're going to talk about today. These monomers, they undergo a reaction called polymerization. And the polymerization reaction, we're not going to go into the details, but this allows the formation of polymers from these very small monomers. So again, remember, a polymer is made up of repetitive units of smaller molecules. So this is called the vinyl group. And this vinyl group undergoes polymerization reactions when treated with a proper catalyst. You can think of the polymerization reaction as a continuous addition of one monomer after another to the end of a growing polymer chain. So we call these polymers chain growth polymers. Here's an example here of ethylene or ethene. Okay, it undergoes a polymerization reaction and we see that there's addition to the carbon-carbon double bonds. Anyway, these keep adding and adding where the N would be for many, many units. And in this case here, we would end up with a polyethylene polymer, okay? So polyethylene. Notice that we still have the ENE suffix even though the polymer itself has no carbon-carbon double bonds. Let's take a look here. We could start off with a monomer of propylene. That undergoes polymerization reaction and we end up with the polymer polypropylene. Here's another one. Here we have styrene. Okay, this is a benzene ring. We haven't talked about those yet, but we will. And here we have the alkene side chain. And this undergoes polymerization. Notice that the benzene ring is still retained. And we end up with polystyrene, good old fashioned styrofoam. Now, the properties of a particular polymer are going to depend on, number one, the monomer type, the average size of large molecules in a sample. So for example, we, we don't talk about molecular weight when referring to a polymer. We talk about an average molecular weight. And also the branching in the polymer. So for example, um, a less branch polymer, this means the molecules would be able to pack more tightly, we refer to as HDPE. Or for example, for polyethylene, that would be high density polyethylene. The more branched, the molecules do not pack as tightly. So the more branches you have, the less tightly the molecules can pack and that results in a low density polyethylene. Let's take a look at this table here. 
And this just lists some polymers and their monomers and the uses. So, of course, if we start with the monomer ethylene, uh, this is the structure of the monomer, and the polymer name is polyethylene, and this is used in bottles and plastic packaging and such. And then we have propylene, that's the monomer name, and this would be the structure of the monomer, and the polymer name would be polypropylene. I think we've all heard of this. This would be in, in plastic bottles, ropes, um, pails, medical tubing, and so on. And then we have vinyl chloride, and we've all heard of PVC, so that's used as plastic pipe, so the PVC, if you will. Um, here's the styrene, and this is the monomer structure, and when that undergoes polymerization, we end up with polystyrene, and we find that in foams and molded plastics and such, and even those little packing peanuts that we um, find in a package. Here we have uh, styrene and butadiene monomers, and these result in synthetic rubber that we find in tires on our cars. Acrylonitrile, I think we've all heard of that. The polymer name is Orlon. I think that's the more popular name. And we find that in carpeting and different fibers. Then we have methyl macrolite. That's the monomer. It looks like this, a little more complicated. And the polymer name is lucite or plexiglass. And of course, we find that in our contact lenses and windows. And then one very common polymer that is formed from the monomer tetrafluoroethylene, which has this structure, is Teflon. And as we know, Teflon is a nonstick coating, but we also find it in replacement heart valves and blood vessels. So just an idea of some of the different types of polymers that we encounter on a daily basis. So now what we're gonna talk about are the aromatic compounds. And aromatic compounds contain benzene-like rings. So what is benzene? Well, benzene is our simplest aromatic carbon, and it has this formula here, C6H6. So this here would be the um, structure of benzene. And it looks like it's a ring of six carbons that alternates between double and single bonds. So you would think, well, the name would be cyclohexatriene. No, it is not. Because this is not a ring of alternating single and double bonds. Okay, so this structure, we can actually draw two equivalent structures, right? The only difference between them is the location of these electrons, if you will. So they only differ in the position of the so-called double bonds. So these are resonance structures. I think you remember resonance structures from last semester. The true structure then would be an average, if you will, of these two structures here, of these two resonance structures. And we would represent it like so. Again, benzene undergoes resonance, and resonance is where the true structure of the molecule is an, actually an average among the two or more conventional structures. So what does this mean? Well, it means that these are not single and double bonds. It means that those six electrons are shared equally in that ring. That's what resonance is. In other words, this pair of electrons does not stay here. This doesn't stay there. This doesn't stay there. The electrons are delocalized about the ring. So this is actually the better structure. And it turns out that as far as these bond lengths go, 
They're equivalent. These bonds are equivalent to one another. We don't have a double bond. We don't have a single bond. In fact, each one of these six bonds has a bond length of somewhere between a single and a double bond. So not quite a single bond, but not quite a double bond, somewhere in between. So what resonance does, if you recall, it stabilizes a molecule. So it provides a lot of stabilization. Now, a little bit later, we're going to find that there are a lot of aromatic compounds that can contain a nitrogen in place of a carbon in the ring. And some contain oxygens as well. But we will talk about those as we come across them in future sections. Now, just so you know, when we draw this structure, okay, remember we have six hydrogens. So each carbon is bonded to one hydrogen. Okay, because again, that formula is C6H6. But what I want you to take home here is these are not alternating single and double bonds. The six bonds here are equivalent to one another, and that's due to resonance, which is electron delocalization. So these six electrons are shared equally by the carbons in this ring. Now, what we're going to do is talk a little bit about the properties of aromatic compounds. The benzene ring is nonpolar, insoluble in water, volatile, it's flammable, and there are some aromatic compounds that are toxic. So benzene has been implicated as a source of leukemia, and uh, dimethyl substituted benzenes are central nervous system depressants. So, but then again, we're going to find a lot of um, benzene rings in our pharmaceuticals and things like that. So they're not all toxic, but benzene is definitely toxic. We used to use it in the lab many, many years ago, but now we, we wouldn't use benzene in an undergraduate lab. We're going to learn how to name the aromatic compounds. I know my drawing is not the greatest. This would be benzene, okay? But for monosubstituted benzenes, we just name benzene as the parent. And we don't need any number to indicate the position of the substituent. And that's only for monosubstituted. So in this case here, we have a benzene ring. This would be benzene. We have a chlorine. This would be chlorobenzene. For example, if I were to put a bromine here, this would be bromobenzene. Here we have a benzene ring with an ethyl group, so we would just call that ethyl benzene. This group here, the NO2 group, this is a nitro group. We would call this nitro benzene. Here we have a benzene ring with a methyl group. The IUPAC name is methyl benzene, but the common name is toluene. In fact, even if I order this methyl benzene from like Fisher Scientific, it is listed as toluene. This group here, the NH2 group, is an amino group. So this would be called amino benzene. So make sure that you know the amino group, the nitro group, and here's one more. Here we have a benzene ring with a hydroxyl group, and we call this hydroxybenzene. That's the IUPAC name. And the more common name is phenol. Practice naming these compounds. Now, if you have disubstituted aromatic compounds, what we do is use prefixes instead of numbers. Remember, for the cycloalkanes and the cycloalkenes, we use numbers to indicate where the substituents are located but not with the aromatic compounds. We use the prefixes. We use the prefix ortho, and that shows the two substituents in a one-two relationship. So for example, down here, we have a benzene ring, two chlorines. They're in a one-two position, 
And so this would be called orthodichlorobenzene. And rather than write out the word ortho, we just use a lowercase o. Meta is where the two substituents are in a 1-3 relationship. So right here, um, we have a nitro group and we have a bromine group. And they're in a 1-3 position. So this would be called meta bromo nitro benzene. Okay, we use a lowercase m to show the meta position. And then we have the para, where the substituents are in a 1 4 relationship. So this would be P, we have two methyl groups, dimethyl benzene. There are going to be times when the benzene ring itself is considered a substituent group which is attached to a parent compound. Usually if the substituent has five or more carbons, then we would name the benzene ring as a substituent. So when we name it as a substituent, we call it the phenyl group. All right, so this is this group right here. So in this case here, we certainly have a substituent that has more than five carbons. So what we would do is, we would go ahead and number the carbons as usual, and this would be called an octane. We have eight carbons. And on carbon number four, we have the phenyl group. So this would be four phenyl octane. You're gonna see that a lot, um, especially when we get more into the text. Now we're gonna look at some common names of a few of the aromatic compounds, and you should know these. So again, the benzene with the methyl group, methyl benzene is toluene. And later on, we're gonna look at another family of compounds called phenols, and they will have this benzene ring with the OH group. The IUPAC name, of course, for this is hydroxybenzene, but this is a phenol. Aniline, this is the amino benzene. Uh, remember, this is the amino group. and But this benzene ring with the amino group, its common name is aniline. The benzene ring with the two methyl groups, this is called paraxylene. This one here is benzoic acid. It has this carboxyl group here. And then this one here is benzaldehyde. For now, we haven't talked about carboxylic acids yet, and we haven't talked about the aldehydes. So for now, I expect you to know both the IUPAC names and the common names for these three compounds here. We'll talk about these other ones later. So let's go ahead and talk about a few reactions of the aromatic compounds. And aromatic compounds are very stable. They don't undergo addition reactions like alkenes because they're not alkenes. Remember, those are not alternating double and single bonds. An aromatic compound is gonna undergo a substitution reaction. In other words, one of the hydrogens is gonna be replaced by some group. So one of these hydrogens on the ring will be replaced by some group. Remember, the benzene ring is very electron rich. So most likely the atom or a group of atoms that substitute a hydrogen are not going to be electron rich, okay? So we might have some substance YX a bond breaks here, a bond breaks here between a carbon and a hydrogen. The hydrogen then forms a compound with a substance with X, and Y substitutes where the hydrogen once was. So in these reactions, the benzene ring remains intact. It's only the hydrogens that are replaced. So these are substitution reactions. Let's take a look at a few of these substitution reactions. So here we start off with benzene 
and this is a halogenation reaction and we usually have an iron halide catalyst yeah that was definitely a mistake there that should be an iron three halide so that might be iron three chloride iron three bromide but this would be a catalyst this would function as a catalyst what's going to happen is one of these chlorine atoms will replace a hydrogen atom on the benzene ring and then the hydrogen that is lost will combine with the other chlorine atom to form this and here we see we end up with chlorobenzene so one chlorine atom has replaced a hydrogen atom on the aromatic ring. Again, the benzene ring itself remains intact. Nitration is another chemical reaction. And this is carried out with nitric acid and a sulfuric acid catalyst. And again, what's going to happen is one of the hydrogens on the benzene ring is going to be replaced by the nitro group, the NO2 group. So we see what happens here. This bond breaks here, and this bond breaks. The hydrogen and the OH combine to form water, and the nitro group, this NO2, then bonds to the carbon. So here we end up with the nitro benzene. This is actually a key step in explosive synthesis and also for pharmaceutical agents. So nitrobenzene, it's used as a starting material for the preparation of aniline, which we just saw. Remember the aniline looks like this. Okay, with that NH2 group on. And aniline, one of its uses is to make bright colored dyes for clothing. And so this is a very, very important reaction. And then finally, we're going to look at two more reactions. And here we have sulfonation. And basically, a hydrogen is substituted by a sulfanic acid group. Okay. So here we would use sulfur trioxide, again, sulfuric acid, and then the sulfanic acid group replaces one of the hydrogens on the ring. So here it is right here, and this is benzene sulfonic acid. This is really an important reaction because it is a key step in the synthesis of the sulfa drugs. And we know that sulfur drugs are used as antibiotics. Here is an example of a sulfa antibiotic. Another reaction is called alkylation. Alkylation is where an alkyl group substitutes for one of the hydrogens in the ring. Okay, This here doesn't show the hydrogens, but I'll go ahead and draw them in for you. And let's see. I mean, a lot of times you're not, you're just going to see the benzene ring. Uh, but you just know that one of the hydrogens is going to be substituted. Now, what we need is an alkyl halide for this. You can think of an alkyl halide as being a, an alkane with a halide replacing one of the hydrogens. So this here is chloroethane. We'll talk about those in the next chapter. What would happen is this ethyl group, would substitute for one of these hydrogens on the benzene ring. We do need a catalyst, so aluminum chloride is usually used as a catalyst. So here we go from benzene to ethyl benzene. You know, if I were to use this alkyl halide, I could use let's say I used bromopropane then we would end up with this propyl group as the substituent, okay? You can go ahead and design the product that you want by just choosing an alkyl halide. So here we've seen where ethyl benzene is formed by using the chloroethane, and 
here we have propyl benzene formed from using this bromo propane. Okay, we could make a lot of different compounds depending on the alkyl halide that we use. That's it as far as the reactions go. So you should know those four reactions. And here I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about PAHs or polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, that should not have an S there. So poly polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and what they are is they're compounds that have benzene rings that are fused together. And these PAHs are the result of when you burn something. So it could be a volcano eruption where there's flame. It could be um, your fireplace. It could be uh, a fire at a home or a business. In fact, when you grill your food, you're producing these PAHs. All right. So they are all over. You know, think about when you drive your car. What are you doing? You're burning oil. PAHs are being produced. In fact, in my real labs, my students do look at PAHs, um, especially in foods, because it's quite interesting. Anyway, there are many PAHs. These are just um, a few of the different ones. Here we have anthracene, phenanthrene. Benzoapyrene is probably the most carcinogenic PAH. And, you know, that's, again, that, that can be produced when you grill your foods, um, when people smoke a cigarette. But this one here is pretty nasty. But anyway, um, not all of them have been proven to be carcinogenic. Like the benzene ring, these are very flat molecules, okay? And if you don't believe me, go ahead and make up a model of the benzene ring, and you'll see that it's very uh, flat. And so when you have a series of rings like this, you have a very flat molecule. Anyway, it's because of their structure that they're known carcinogens. They're basically able to insert into the DNA, and which will eventually cause the cancer. But these uh, PAHs, as I said, they're very stable. When I say stable, that means they are not very reactive. They don't react. They're very, very difficult to eliminate from the body. So again, there are many more of these uh, PAHs. So that's the end of this material for chapter 20. Everyone have a great day. If you have any questions, please contact me.